Welcome to uh, a lecture on torts. This lecture is a course that we ha typically have in our first year law school education. It is a cousin to crimes and uh, I want you to understand that if you take in this class in person instead of seeing me online, you would get a tort. This is a delicious pastry spelled with an E on, it, on the end of it. So when you're taking this class for me online, of course you don't get a tort but also you can go buy one at the Jewel, but um, you don't put an E on the end of tort. That is the old English vocabulary word, and it's a civil um, wrong, and it comes from an old British concept that something is crooked. So you'll find a very easy multiple choice question asking you about what is a tort. But for the purposes of today's 30 minute lecture, which can be listened to for extra credit, and you'll find it under the modules in either week three if you're taking a 16-week class or week two if you're taking an eight-week version of this class. We start off with the three areas of the civil law and this law provides a dollar amount and monetary damages. We have three conceptual areas that you need to focus on. First of which is the intentional torts. Second of which is negligence. And finally, strict liability. An intentional tort is one that the person who uh, is conducting the action knew what they were doing, they knew it was wrong, they knew the consequences. And this is very important in that there was intent. In criminal law, we call this mens rea, which you can pick up in our lecture on criminal law, we, that the person knew that they were doing it. So we have a body of mm, seven or eight intentional torts as people come to know them. And I'm sure you've heard that word before. First of which we like to talk about is the A and Bs of intentional torts. That is assault and battery. An assault can be verbal, it can be nonverbal, and it is uh, an intentional uh, swearing at someone, um, shouting uh, words at someone. It is usually coupled, if it's not mitigated, by a battery, which is when you actually have a physical touching of someone. So the A is the verbal or nonverbal, and the B is touching the body. That's how I remembered it, with the B for body. It's touching the body of someone. Uh, folks will say to me, well, I got in a fight with some guy and I punched him in the nose. And I thought he got criminal assault. Yes, uh, assault can be both criminal and it can be civil. Uh, but, they, but you will note from both of those things that it has to be intentional. The person had to know they were assaulting and battering you. It, couldn't, it can't just be accidentally like you bump, bump somebody with your elbow in the hall or uh, you have some casual um, words that you say that somebody overhears. They ha you have to show intent with these particular intentional torts. Another one that we like to focus on is false imprisonment. My, my children are often asking me when I ground them if they've been falsely imprisoned in, the, in our home. And the, but the most common use of the false imprisonment tort, which we oftentimes, besides our A and B that we just talked about, we talk about FI, false imprisonment, is called the shopkeeper's privilege. If you are shopping at Woodfield Mall or in Algonquin Commons and you um, are detained by a security guard. Can they falsely imprison you? Can they tell you that they want to put you in a, in a room and have you be interviewed? Yes. And But does the shopkeeper have a privilege and a right to do that if they have some suspicious conduct on your part? Yes. Um, and then, so we do have, it with all these torts, we have defenses like the shopkeeper's privilege. We have uh, the non-intentional assault and battery. Those are the defenses used to these intentional torts. Um, we have in, also something that we nicknamed intentional infliction of emotional distress, the IID tort. Again, it's an intentional tort. So if a mom and dad happen to drive by a scene of an accident and it turns out their child was in the accident, uh, can they sue the driver of the other car for intentional infliction of emotional distress? It's oftentimes attenuated to prove that the, the people really intended for you to see what was happening and that they intended to cause you intentional infliction of emotional distress. Oftentimes we see these cases um, or these claims for IIED brought in the 
uh, you published a negative news story about me case or you're causing my family distress um, perhaps something that you know with the stormy daniels uh, Melania, Melania and Donald Trump issues that you would see people arguing that there's emotional distress to a family if someone engages in intentional conduct. Um, and, and again, you have to intend to do what you're doing. We have um, another tort, which oftentimes sounds like the grocery shop of torts, um, spoliation. And we're not talking about food spoiling here, but it, 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 we do use the word spoliation. This is the disappearing emails from the Hillary Clinton cases, the, the disappearing or edited email from Noons last week. Um, people are arguing that the earlier data that disappearing has been spoiled or destroyed. Best case I've read in Illinois is under the Mayor Daley administration called the Sorich case. Uh, there are two gentlemen who are still sitting in jail as the case was affirmed by the Seventh Circuit, but it involved a patronage hiring list that was kept by some of the of the Mayor Daley folks that they took and threw in Lake Michigan. And in addition to the patronage hiring that they were also charged with, they were also charged with the tort of spoliation because they attempted to destroy the computers that had all the lists on. The FBI did manage to pull those the spoiled evidence out of Lake Michigan that convicted these gentlemen and the courts said that's an okay way to get the evidence and it's an also a tort called spoliation if you try to throw a computer with the bad data into the garbage or into or you destroy it or you have a hacker take care of it. Um, we do have another tort that um, oftentimes you see in advertising but you don't necessarily understand um, this tort. It's the tort of product disparagement. And what do we mean by product disparagement? We mean some of those Super Bowl ads where you see gently someone suggesting that their product is better than the other because there's something wrong with the other person's product. Um, uh, Burger King and McDonald's oftentimes are fighting on, on both the internet, in TV and radio ads and newspaper ads about whose fries are better, whose burger's bigger. Um, uh, it, it isn't just in the food industry, but you see um, I'm oftentimes fascinated to watch uh, John Cusack go on television with one of the uh, cell phone companies and say that his company has more coverage all across the United States and he has a big map with a bunch of little dots on it and then you see the other providers come back on and say they have better 4G coverage or better 3G coverage. The, the cause of action for any of those folks to go after each other only exists if someone intentionally disparages a product knowing that the information that they're handing out about their competitor is false or the information that they're heading out, handing out about themselves to make their competitors look bad is also false. So we have, um, we have that tort. Uh, I'll, I'll wind up this section on intentional torts with a talk about trespass. Two kinds of trespass torts. Trespass to land, trespass to chattel. I didn't know what a chattel was before I went to law school and probably most of you don't realize that it's not cattle, it's chattel. It's, it's a piece of personal property. That's the old English term for it. Um, it has to be intentional when you trespass on someone's land. Can you be charged with a tort if uh, your car slides over on your neighbor's sidewalk and grass in the snowy weather today? No, it, that's an accident or it, maybe it's negligent driving, but if you didn't intend to drive your car up on your neighbor's lawn or you didn't intend to hit the big brick marquee as you drove into MCC, it's not trespass to land or trespass to the the monument out there, uh, trespass to chattel. But they are, there are two intentional torts that, that um, you can get people for trespass. Is taking some device and scraping the side of someone's car trespassing? Yes. So if you have video and you can prove who did it and that they intended to do it, that's an intentional tort. If they just accidentally opened their door and hit your door at Costco, that's not an intentional tort. Having completed an overview of our intentional torts, I'd like to move on to negligence. Negligence, a step above the classic accident that I'm talking about in the snow, um, has a little less uh, strict standard than the intentional tort. Negligence has four elements. Duty, breach, causation, and damages. And I'm going to finish up with one other tort that kind of spins off of product uh, disparagement, and that is defamation. 
It can be negligent defamation or it could be intentional defamation. So you can find allegations and causes of action for both. Um, yesterday, the Polish government uh, decided to regulate speech and tell its citizens that it should, they should not be making statements about Poland's involvement with the Holocaust or if they do, it will be considered defamation in their country. So they're regulating speech. Um, there are lots of movie stars from George Clooney and Amal and any number of others who sue for defamation if something about them as a public figure is put out there that is false or their pictures taken of their children and the likelihood of their children is misappropriated or as George Clooney's found people both in his yard and in his house taking pictures, there's a tort if it's done intentionally. Um, you know, uh, but it can also be done negligently. So you may have defamation uh, at hand. You will have two kinds of defamation besides negligent and intentional. You'll have libel and slander. In law school, I, I learned some very cute little ditty about how to remember the difference, but it all boils down to is um, slander is spoken. So in a libel is a label. And so if you think about it that way, you can keep the, them distinct. One is written and one is verbal. So that was, the, that was the little device that I had to remember the two of them. But again, they can also be intentional and negligent, slander and intentional libel. You gotta be careful, students, what you write. In terms of the four elements of negligence, there has to be a duty involved. And meaning it can't be an accident. You have to have a duty to drive carefully on the roadway. You have to have a duty um, to take good care of other people's property. There has to be a breach. Something must have happened. The trickiest element always to prove is what caused an accident. For those of you who are taking this Business 241 class, we have a wonderful homework assignment for the written memo, and it's on um, a water border, a, water, a wake border, excuse me, no water boarding here at MCC. Um, a wake border who uh, is out with a life preserver on, it hits a rock, his body's never found, and his parents want to sue the life preserver manufacturer for both negligence, strict liability, and an intentional tort. They're not going to be able to prove an intentional tort. So negligence becomes the key issue. But no one knows why the water boarder actually uh, injured himself and, and subsequently was not found in the water. Did he hit on his head on the rock? Did he try an aerial trick that was too difficult? Causation is going to be the key issue. What caused the negligent behavior? And again, we focus on damages because we want to get monetary damages in a civil negligence action. Uh, Illinois happens to be a comparative negligence jurisdiction, meaning we assign the percentage of fault. And California and other states are, have the more harsher approach, which is not comparing the negligence of the plaintiff and the defendant, but actually if there is any contribution by the plaintiff at all, he picked the wrong life preserver. He picked one that didn't match his weight. He was wearing one that said for non-swimmers, uh, please don't wear this. If there's any negligence on the part of the, um, of the individual who is the plaintiff in the case, then they're barred from any recovery. Illinois likes to feed lawyers, so we have a comparative jurisdiction where both lawyers get up and try to argue who did, whose fault was 80%, whose was 20%. The key operative word is it, if you're over 50% liable, there's a significant reduction in damages. Um, and that is what I have to say about negligence, uh, is to think about the elements. Can the plaintiff prove all four of them? And, and or do the defenses of comparative or contributory negligence kick in to reduce the amount of damages? The last area that we're going to cover in torts today is strict liability. And uh, people always say to me, what is strict liability? And uh, does that mean it's tougher than intentional torts? Does, and it, not really. Does that mean it's tougher than negligence? No, not really. The best ex the way to explain strict liability is to say it involves a concern of public health and safety, meaning you should not go to Wendy's and find a finger in your chili. You should not wake up from your surgery that you just had for your hip with extra sponges inside. These are examples of strict liability where the public has trusted somebody as to their health and safety of their food or their surgery and there's something so outrageous that occurs that it just can't possibly have happened without some fault of the person who is acting upon you. I mean, it just doesn't happen that you get a, a finger in your chili or a sponge in your stomach. It just doesn't work that way. Um, 
But again, in those cases, and, and I would say in our wheeler versus waterboarding, water sports, excuse me, I'm stuck on waterboarding, water sports case, uh, it's an issue of public safety that you're using a life preserver. Um, endemic to the name life preserver is the fact that you'd probably wear it and live after you wore it. So um, we're, we're concerned if, uh, if that, that a manufacturer know and instruct people by their warnings, their express warranties that as to what the weight of the life preserver is and, and uh, adjust for their different customers ac according, accordingly. Um, this discussion of these three elements leads into a chapter in our book, chapter 25 and some of your additions on products liability, where they get into a little more detail about the recovery, the damages, how that is figured out. When we conduct this exercise in class and we do our wonderful trial, many of you will come in with life preservers and you'll also come in with actuarial charts telling me that our 20-year-old uh, wakeboarder um, his life expectancy would be roughly in the 70s for a gentleman who's in good health and thus how much you're expecting the estate to recover based on his life expectancy if you can prove that any of these two civil tort, three civil tort theories are um, actionable against the manufacturer of the life preserver. And, and, and really and truly there's a fourth category that I just want to remind all of you. A lot of people tend to when they know that attorney's fees and dollar recoveries are available tend to exaggerate uh, um, instances and take them out of the realm of accidents. We still have accidents. I mean, if we were to leave the parking lot today in, in, with the snow and ice and two cars back up into each other in the parking lot, slipping and sliding out there in McHenry County parking lot, it'd be really hard to prove that there's some negligence today given the snow conditions. And that's, that's sort of context that in those cases is introduced so that everybody realizes there was not an intentional tort. I mean, unless, you know, Pete Lilly really wanted to rear-end my car uh, for making him film this for an hour today. But uh, um, that, that, that just doesn't happen that people intend to have car accidents. But what we do look at is who is more likely than not what, what should the reasonable person have done? Is there a car out there that didn't have any uh, side mirrors so they were watching for backing up and that person might be more responsible in our comparative negligence jurisdiction? Is there, I was recently in a car accident where a young gentleman hit me with, um, he'd forgotten to fill the air up in the tire and he was rushing because his grandfather was in the hospital and he hit me with a flat tire and he hit me because he couldn't stop. That, it, it takes it out of the realm of an accident. It turns it into um, somebody's at fault because they did not have their car ready or their mindset ready or uh, you know their property ready to be engaged in um, driving around. I, I leave this thought with you on the tort discussion that certainly the driverless cars, drones, uh, much of our technology is now pushing the limits of these old English theories that we've talked about with torts. But torts do apply on the internet. Torts, uh, do, they do apply with the use of technology. It doesn't matter if you use a drone to go spy on George Clooney's new twins um, and you physically don't do it yourself. We still apply the law of torts. Um, I had a student today who sent me a discussion forum post who said, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. We said it on the internet. You know, that internet's a wild, crazy circus. If you defame someone on the internet, if you disparage McDonald's property on the internet, it still applies on the internet. It, it, it doesn't matter if you're using technology of a drone or a computer or um, you know a chat room. You, so you have to really remember that these three theories don't go away um, of strict liability, of negligence, of intentional torts with their damage remedies. And uh, interestingly, students, if you are involved in international business or you're involved in international travel, I've gotten a few discussion forum posts where students think that whatever the laws were in America happen to apply in uh, in our foreign happen to not apply in foreign countries. Uh, you'd be very surprised at how strict the rules are. A defamation, as you students know from your assignment this week in torts, in the Amanda Knox case. Uh, the mother and stepfather said uh, the Italian police had physically battered their daughter during an interrogation and they said it to um, a, a London newspaper and a London uh, interview that also went viral and the parents were charged in Italy, not in America or in England with uh, defamation and uh, the penalty in uh, 
Italy for defamation is criminal only, it's not civil. And if you defame the police, it's up to three to six years in jail and many euros, so, uh, or lira, depending on how, what you're counting with that day. But um, so my students are still grappling with the notion that a, a person who is an American can be traveling and make an offhanded comment that maybe isn't, they think is an opinion, but if it in some way tarnishes the reputation of even other constitutional democracies such as Italy, that you can get in trouble in Italy for saying it. Um, we are blessed with um, absolutist First Amendment rights here in the United States, and our notions of how defamation is enforced or how torts are enforced uh, differ significantly even from the other constitutional democracies. And so after you complete the 10-point quiz on the lecture on torts, you'll be conducting a 10-point discussion forum on an international comparison of defamation, and you'll be, con and you'll be writing Either, if you're in the alphabet from A to L, you'll be writing as the plaintiff's counsel for the dead family, the uh, wake boarders family, Mr. Wheeler's family, well, looking for money, or you'll be defending uh, Water Sports Inc., f um, stating that their life preserver um, was not negligently constructed and there was no intentional tort and that it was its strict liability standards were met because it was designed properly and the only things that uh, ha happened here is that the individual who wore it either misused it doing an aerial trick, altered the product, or assumed the risk, or there's some comparative negligence involved. Uh, that concludes our lecture today on torts. Looking forward to all three of your assignments.